delighted to uh, welcome the esteemed scholars here today. Uh, I've been taught by one of them at least in, in my university days. Uh, uh, and uh, mm. I know so their work very closely. Uh, but also, uh, I'm, I'm also really excited that you know, such an interesting uh, topic will be discussed here. Uh, and uh, while we allow all the people also to come in and while more people are joining in, uh, let me welcome, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Patrick French, the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and I think uh, who had actually uh, the key person who, who imagined how the seminar and lecture series would uh, work. So this is basically his brainchild. So uh, let me invite Professor Patrick to give a, uh, you know, to introduce the panel today, but also to introduce the topic of uh, today's discussion. Uh, Patrick French. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Satak. Uh, it's really incredible to know that the first time that we're trying this online version of seminar lecture series, we have got, um, I see now about 85 visitors. Uh, we've got people not over from, not only from neighboring parts of uh, Ahmedabad, uh, I am Ahmedabad, IIT Gandhinagar, uh, other places in Maharashtra, in India, we've got people from Nagaland, we've got people from Ashoka University, we're also joined by somebody from Edinburgh, somebody from London, uh, somebody from Columbia University in New York, uh, Perina Lawrence at Yale. Uh, we've got somebody from Hong Kong, a few people from Sri Lanka. Uh, we've amazingly got people from Namibia, from South Korea. Um, and even an old, an old colleague, Naeem uh, Mohamin, uh, who's joining from Columbia, who I first met uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh in mid-1990s, and who I last saw in New York, goodness only knows when. So it's a really amazing thing to have so many people here today. So um, I would like to welcome you all to this seminar, Long Decolonization, Challenges for the Curriculum in a 21st Century University, and in particular to our three main invited speakers, who I will introduce in the order in which they will appear. First, Jess Auerbach is a senior lecturer in anthropology at Northwest University in South Africa. She has a PhD from Stanford, MSc from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar, a South African Rhodes Scholar, quite relevant for today's uh, discussion. Uh, she's also the author of From Water to Wine, Becoming Middle Class in Angola, and her research interests include the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and decolonial pedagogy. Our second speaker, Paige Raymond, is a settler and scholar and mother and invited guest, I'm using her phrases, who lives on the unceded ancestral territory of the Halkomelem speaking Muskeem people in Canada. She is professor of history at the University of British Columbia and also the editor of BC Studies, the British Columbia Quarterly and she is an associate of the L.R. Wilson Institute for Canadian History at McMaster University. Our third speaker, Sujata Patel, is distinguished professor at Savitri Bhai Pune University in India. Her work on modernity and social theory, history of sociology and social sciences, urbanization and city formation, social movements, gender construction and caste and class formation in India combines an historical sensibility with four perspectives, Marxism, feminism, spatial studies, and post-structuralism. She was the president of the Indian Sociological Society quite recently. Uh, as well, we are joined in order to give a little bit of framing and introduction to Ahmedabad University itself, by my colleague, Professor Leah Matthew, who has kindly stepped in in place of Professor Aditi Dale. Uh, Leah is somebody who looks at the socio-cultural transitions around economic liberalization in India. Uh, she's on a prestigious grant, a prestigious fellowship uh, at the moment, but she's still uh, with us. She did her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. And then we're also joined by one more uh, speaker or uh, a ranger of uh, other speakers, shall we say, um, Professor Aparajit Ramnath, who is a historian of science and technology. Um, he is the author of a very uh, well-received book, OUP book, The Birth of an Indian Profession, uh, 
about the origination of engineering as a profession in India in the half century before Indian uh, independence. He's also the program chair for the Bachelor of Arts uh, honors degree at Ahmedabad University. So just by way of introduction, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that Ahmedabad University was created by the Ahmedabad Education Society, which itself was formed in the 1930s with a view to thinking what happens after freedom, what happens after independence or dominion status, probably people would have been thinking at that time. Uh, we are going to need a different kind of education. And although as a university we're only 11 years old, the thinking behind the idea of this university does uh, date back really to the 1930s. We are a private nonprofit uh, institution and we are in the process of developing all sorts of different courses and programs, particularly at School of Arts and Sciences, which is only three years old. And the seminar and lecture series and our events around humanities and social sciences are part of that. And I think that the, the sort of logic behind today's event on long decolonization came out of a number of different conversations and discussions that many of us had had. One of them was the global wish to think about the curriculum afresh, which perhaps is perceived differently in countries that have themselves been through colonization and the post-colonial period in a different way to how it might be seen in a European country or in the United States. So we were in a way trying to think of the other side of the, the story. We were also thinking about the fact that in our own learning, the courses that we set up, uh, very often it's easy to be funneled back into old methods of teaching simply because the materials are there or the books are there, are there and it's easy to go on reproducing something rather than thinking more uh, originally. Um, as well as that, I think we were interested in the idea of how particular disciplines get formed in India in the 19th and 20th century, how a discipline like sociology, anthropology, history, uh, political science operates differently in India. And I think anybody who works in India or who is from India uh, cannot avoid looking at these questions on almost a daily basis, because a lot of the, the, the sort of early theory in many academic fields seems different once you take it into a different uh, social context to the one in which it very often um, originated. Uh, the final point that I'd like to make is what we hope may come out of today's discussion. Uh, there are two things that I personally would be very happy to see uh, in terms of future events or future seminars um, held either by us or by other universities. One is a very practical thing around teaching materials, uh, forms of pedagogy, forms of learning, um, the actual sort of day-to-dayness of how you teach a particular subject and whether across, across in particular different universities in the global south and in particularly those that are new, um, are there the things that we have in common? Is it possible to have some kind of transnational idea of a new kind of approach to, to teaching? And then the, the second thing is really whether it's possible to make any kind of theoretical shift or development. Because although we have been talking and probably will be talking today about the idea of provincializing Europe, the idea that you want to move sort of beyond the, the, the colonial or immediate post-colonial period, um, theoretically, it's a little difficult to see where that debate has gone in the last 10 or 20 years. Is there a direction that we collectively may want to take it in, in, in order to look at this subject in a slightly, uh, slightly different and creative uh, way? So um, just to, uh, uh, before I pass over to, to Leia, I'm just gonna outline the format of the next um, 75 uh, minutes. So first of all, to anybody who's just joined while I've been speaking, um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on which country you are in. Um, the first person to will be uh, Professor Leah Matthew. She'll speak for about five to eight minutes. 
She will then hand over to Jess Auerbach, who will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Jess will turn, in turn hand over to Paige Raymond. Paige will in turn hand over to Sujata Patel, who in turn will hand over to Aparajit Rama. So Aparajit will be guiding the questions that you ask, and he will be leading the discussion that follows the presentation. Now, please do feel uh, free and able to ask questions into the chat box at any point of the seminar. And um, Aparajit will take them out of the chat and he will either to one or to several of the uh, people on our and a very welcome to, to Thank you, Patrick. Um, this is very exciting. Thank you, Aparajit, Aditi, Sarthak, all the people who work to put this together. I'm standing in for Aditi, um, who was part of the organizing team and who couldn't make it today for because of a family emergency. And I'm going to take a cue from the title. Uh, this is something that Aditi had sp spoken about at great length, long decolonization. Um, to suggest that you know what we are doing here is a beginning, not necessarily that we will arrive at answers, but that I think it's um, about trying, about recognizing that this is important and that we are committed to trying. Uh, the School of Arts and Science especially is um, very young. We are only three years old, as Patrick mentioned. And um, these are some of the core um, aspects, core values that we are committed to thinking with. To briefly sort of frame um, the seminar and also to introduce Ahmedabad University and our students to today's speakers, we are largely an undergrad um, student population who typically come from a schooling system that prepares you for high stakes standardized exams. You know, so really at the institutional level, something like decolonization, they are probably encountering it for the first time at an institutional level. At a personal level, I think all of us do encounter it given our location. So in many ways, it is a disorienting pedagogy. You know, and um, as instructors to be mindful of that disorientation and to guide ourselves and our students through what is more of a journey. Um, the, and another thing that I would like to mention about knowledge production and the Eurocentrism of it that um, especially those in the social sciences encounter as Patrick mentioned every day is also that um, along with Eurocentrism as Professor Sujata Patel has written about extensively, there are a lot of other divisions as well that we inhabit. Um, in Ahmedabad, it's difficult not to you know, talk about the deep divisions that um, are part of the society. So along with transnational histories, there are also internal domestic histories that we need to take into account in our own curriculum. And the last uh, point that I would like to mention is that in some ways, Social sciences, it seems easier to do it because as provincializing Europe, you know, the some parts have already been laid out. We have to make new parts, of course, but some directions are there. We can follow in somebody's footsteps. But I keep wondering what it means to decolonize science. You know, what would a curriculum for science at the undergrad level look like if you take decolonization seriously? Um, and I'm happy to welcome Jess. Uh, I read your manifesto um, online and it was so fascinating to see how you are thinking through curriculum. I'll turn over to Jess. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and just talk with a few slides. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so, Hopefully now, are you able to see the, the presentation? All right, okay, great. So thank you. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here and to be part of this discussion today. And these are questions that I really care about and, and have fought with for some time. And the main argument that I'm, I'm going to be making um, is that to shift curricula in real ways, we as faculty and as custodians of the knowledge, people sitting to some extent on the frontier, uh, of learning and teaching have to focus on self-transformation. I've taught at a wide range of institutions um, 
ranging from uh, the University of Pachavala uh, Buila in Angola to institutions in Brazil, uh, and then also to very elite spaces, self-consciously elite spaces, such as Oxford and Stanford. Uh, I've just come back to South Africa after spending more than a decade away. And the one thing that I've become really convinced of is that an average 18-year-old student, especially in the social sciences and humanities, who is reading and engaged and thinking is pretty much the same whether you're looking at an elite university or, or, or somewhere that is less well resourced. And as long as a student is thinking, there's no reason uh, that she or he shouldn't become a world leader um, in their, their chosen fields. And I thought a lot about why this doesn't happen. And I think one thing, especially being at Stanford, taught me is just the confidence of students who come from global centers of power is quite striking. Whereas for many students I've taught who are just as capable in other parts of the world. And there's a feeling that they're aware of their own positioning in the globe. There's a, a feeling that perhaps they are not good enough, that perhaps they don't have a right to speak. And there's also a, a, a sense of uh, different kinds of horizons um, that students have not been uh, taught and empowered to really break out of the particular spaces where they might have spent their childhoods. And it's something that I think, uh, as we, we were responsible for this exposure at this incredible uh, moment of students' development and journeys, have a real responsibility um, to undo some of the received learning uh, that happens through students' early experiences of education and open up the possibilities of global contributions to discourse as soon as possible um, in powerful ways. So what I see as my kind of main job, um, uh, is, is really this process of how do I as a teacher uh, facilitate the emergence of different kinds of voices uh, in the world. I really think that with different sorts of curriculum interventions, this shouldn't be difficult. And especially in the social sciences and humanities, our, our job, and I'm particularly aware of, of whiteness and of my own privilege in this space, um, is, a, is to change our own perspectives and to stick to it. And so that's really what I want to be kind of speaking about now. Um, because it, the question isn't really, why isn't this happening? But why isn't it happening faster? You know, what are, the, what are the things that keep us stuck in the same repetitive patterns that we all have the intellectual uh, and the, the personal skills to, to realize are problematic and replicate systems of global inequality? So I'm gonna, this is a, uh, a piece of student artwork that was done at a, uh, an institution where I used to teach, where three cohorts of students work together to represent um, Africa's place in the world. And it was an incredibly powerful project that they had to uh, write essays about and kind of think with in terms of uh, what they were choosing as symbols, uh, not only the received symbols, but the symbols that they wanted to be speaking to the world and why. Um, and it's interesting to note that, that this has now been painted over and has become a corporate office. And part of that, I think, comes from the fact that there is quite often huge institutional pushback when uh, faculty and students start thinking and critiquing around questions uh, of extractive capitalism. Um, so, you know, one of the things I'm very aware of, and especially with the, the Rhodes piece of this, is that for many of us, our, our personal success in the academy, and when I say us, I mean the people teaching in the academy, it relies on, it has relied on the ability to master the systems of, as, as they exist in the world and to thrive in those uh, very unequal and extractive um, systems. And we're all well aware that within these spaces, um, privileges are very, very carefully guarded. Uh, brands usually rely um, on the funding of those who have vested interests in the status quo. And in some moments, uh, it's possible uh, to change that funding, uh, to, to sort of shift the discourse. It's a lot easier to do so uh, when the people who have funded those institutions have passed away. So this is a, a now very famous moment at the University of Cape Town, which is where I did my undergraduate degree. And uh, that's the, st the statue is of Cecil John Rhodes being lifted off the pedestal, which led to a lot of the kind of decolonization um, debates around the world. Now, it's one thing to do that when you're talking about Cecil John Rhodes, who is uh, long dead, and though his brand uh, remains alive and well, the custodians of it are much more open to a certain kind of change, and institutions around Rhodes are much more diverse uh, and to some extent flexible. 
Then in some, some instances today where much of contemporary capital uh, relies on uh, living millionaires and donors who have very vested interests often in the status quo. Um, and I guess what it comes to is kind of how much are we willing to give up to allow other voices in? And I think this is a really, really important question around curriculum transformation. Um, so for us to change things, to a certain extent, we have to be willing to bite the hand that feeds us. And that in itself can be a very risky endeavor in terms of people's um, careers and the decisions that they make uh, for how they work. And thinking about the previous slide, you know, it, it was perhaps no accident that in that institutional context, the whole department responsible for it landed up resigning because the institution made it clear that critique was not what it existed for. So, you know, at the heart of academic labor, uh, sorry, at the heart of capitalism, um, one finds extraction. Uh, and in my opinion, that's also very much at the heart of academic labor, from publishing to teaching. In the academy as it stands now, our role is to contribute to knowledge and then reproduce students as if these are somehow separate projects. It's a logic that is fundamentally out of touch with contemporary needs and realities. And it's almost based on a model of the church meets the factory. Um, rather than an informed ability to manage our own work around algorithms and the, the algorithms that are already running our lives. And I think that these structures are completely separate from the work that now needs to happen in this new connected world. Um, and instead of re, uh, turning our learning systems into systems that reproduce uh, the insecurity, that reproduce tenuous labor, what we need to be doing is opening up questions that allow people um, to rethink new models, but that also means rethinking the heart of capitalism. And this is something that can be very, very scary um, for institutional uh, gatekeepers. So, you know, when I reflect on the different spaces that I've, I've moved around and so from Brazil and Angola to the United States and, and, and very elite sections of, of the UK Academy, I often think of uh, an observation made by the Israeli historian, um, Noah Yuval Harari, who observes that kind of a, at a sort of base level, most of us have the ability to think about around 150 perspectives at once. And so those, he argues, are the perspectives that would have, you know, when we were running wild on the savannah, would have been in our kind of primal brain, the perspectives of our band. And I think that question is very important for academia because it forces us to interrogate who is in my band? You know, who are the people who are my points of reference? Are they the dons of Oxford? and the self-proclaimed uh, knowledge leaders from your Harvards and your Stanford's? Or are they the people who are thinking in the spaces that I'm in? And some of these questions, uh, of course, they're complex and they're multiple. But as scholars and thinkers who are working towards our students' realities uh, and who are committed to transformative pedagogy, we need to find ways to ensure that those reference points uh, open up to include not only people around us and people in uh, institutions that might not have as, as good access to the publicity mechanisms of, of uh, tier one rated journals, for example, but also to the work that our students are already doing um, in these particular spaces. So, you know, students typically, by the, by the time they come to university, they're already more than capable of original thought. And the question for me is, how do we amplify that? How do we provide them with a certain kind of confidence, with a certain uh, feeling of uh, uh, the right to enter the global stage and the right to start shaping those discourses uh, right from the beginning. Now, the last point that I'm going to make um, comes from uh, the time that I spent in Mauritius. So after leaving the, the university where I was originally based, I spent a year doing research. And, and many of you will now uh, be aware of the Wakashio oil spill that has, uh, took place last month and that has seen uh, tons and tons of oil uh, discharged into a Mauritian uh, marine reserve. But before this happened, uh, I was interviewing uh, some young climate activists in Mauritius for, for work on a new project. And one of them was kind of speaking very sadly about her, her senior thesis and undergraduate and how you know, she just felt like this was such a pointless kind of exercise. And I put on my best professor voice and I said to her, you know, academic knowledge, it's about you know, one contribution, one grain of rice to, to the bowl of available knowledge. And you should just be happy that you are adding this grain of rice. And you know, this is what academic knowledge uh, is about. And she just looked at me and she's like, you know, the bowl is all wrong. 
And I have thought about that comment so many times since. The goal of academic knowledge is completely wrong. Um, and so how do we rethink that goal? How do we shift that goal? And I was so excited to join in this conversation and to learn from all of you in the audience and the other presenters, because I think that ultimately this is a conversation about rethinking that ball, um, about thinking about why this bowl of rice sits undisturbed on the table. It's boundaried, it's cultured, it's desired, and sometimes it's also loathed because of the real starvation that it enables uh, for those who don't have access. We face now the urgent task of breaking, of opening, of changing, and COVID has really made very clear how quickly we have to do that. Uh, and if we don't learn lessons and adjust our, our behaviors rapidly with COVID, uh, then it's very clear that climate change is going to uh, do that uh, right now as well. So observing the, the status quo of Mauritius right now and the state of the world uh, as, we, as we see it, uh, you have the collapse of the United States as a kind of figure of empire, uh, the rise of these very repressive algorithmic systems as well. Uh, for me, it seems to be very clear why listening, generosity, and a kind of personal sacrifice will be necessary for many of us who've been invested in the systems as they've stood to date. And that is the only way through which we'll find uh, a pathway out of the industrial uh, extractive oil-based society that academic societies have enabled, uh, academic communities and academic structures have also enabled and supported um, for such a long time. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Over to Paige. Thanks, Jess. And I'm also looking forward uh, very much to the discussion after and want to thank all the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's so nice to be joining from Canada. So my name is Paige Raveman, and I'm going to review just a little bit here. Uh, so I'm a professor of history at the University of British Columbia. And as a historian of settler descent, uh, my ancestors came to Canada from Hungary, Sweden, and the Russian shtetls, or sort of Eastern, Eastern Europe. I grew up in uh, what you see here and currently work and raise my family in the city that is currently called Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, a little bit remarkably, I think, uh, this city sits on top of unceded land, uh, land that belongs to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and I'm grateful for their hospitality. I am an uninvited guest on these lands, as is this entire nation that we call Canada. Much of Canada, in fact, sits on unceded land, which is in the yellow in this slide, uh, that means it's land that even the Supreme Court of Canada, a colonial institution, recognizes as never having been legally transferred from its Indigenous title holders to the Crown. My thoughts today are my own, and I do not speak for Indigenous peoples or as an Indigenous person. Now, I've learned from many teachers, including the people shown here on the slide, whose influence I acknowledge and I appreciate. What I've just done by way of introduction here, self-introduction, is to introduce myself and my knowledge. I've told you who I am, where I'm from, where I come from, uh, where I'm at, and who I've learned from. So why take the time to do this? Well, because, and this is one of my main points today, learning requires exploration of one's identity. So this is not my idea, um, and I think it dovetails nicely actually with what Jess was just saying as well from a different angle a little bit, but this framing is a first people's principle of learning that I want to argue is applicable to all of us. It invites all learners, including non-Indigenous learners like myself, including professors who I include as learners, to start with ourselves rather than with uh, an Indigenous other. This matters because we all internalize the things we learn as children. Childhood experiences become taken for granted assumptions that we mistake for the norm. And those of us with privilege, uh, includes many of us at universities who have some measure of privilege for sure, even despite the hierarchy of institutions, uh, suffer this illusion the longest because society endorses our perspective. 
Left in place, these assumptions impede our best intentioned efforts to understand histories and people different from our own. They impede development of cultural humility that is necessary for decolonization, decolonizing the curriculum. As feminists, people of color, indigenous peoples have long pointed out, left in place, these assumptions limit efforts at greater inclusion and diversity to an add and stir approach. The same cup of coffee with different sweetener. That is, they leave us telling the same old story with different characters when what we need is a new story or a new bowl. <laughs> um, and left in place, these assumptions leave us talking about the past instead of talking about history. Let me explain what I mean. I'm going to take a few examples from a fourth grade social studies textbook that I recently reviewed. And this book aimed to remedy old stereotypes that characterize descriptions of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And on this count, it did a pretty good job. But it also exemplified the problems with this add and stir approach. That is, it tried to add new characters, in this case, Indigenous ones, to the familiar story of Canadian history. In so doing, it treated concepts and ideas that were specific to particular times and places as though they were unbounded or universal and ahistorical. Things European still pass as universal because of the long entwined histories of colonialism and racism. So this is part of what Dipesh Chakrabarti refers to as the need to provincialize Europe, to demarcate the boundaries around European knowledge, making it situated, local, and specific. I also want to point out uh, this visionary indigenous Shekwetmuk leader, George Manuel from British Columbia, who knew this as well in the 1970s. And he pointed out then that the greatest barrier to the recognition of Aboriginal rights um, was no institution in and of itself. He wrote that such recognition necessitates the reevaluation of assumptions, both about Canada and its history. Real recognition of our presence in humanity would require a genuine reconsideration of so many people's role in North American society that it would amount to a genuine leap of imagination. The greatest preservative for racial myths is the difficulty of developing a new language in which the truth can be spoken easily, quietly, and comfortably. So for example, this book, this textbook that I'll draw on introduced the widespread um, indigenous farming methods called the Three Sisters, uh, where corn, bean, and squash are planted together this way. Uh, Three Sisters planting is very different from many modern farming methods. This sentence situates indigenous peoples uh, within, uh, makes space for indigenous ways of farming at the same time as it marginalizes them. We can avoid this by saying what we really mean if we situate our statement without putting indigenous peoples outside of the modern and write instead that Three Sisters farming was different in many ways from European farming practices of the time. Similarly, uh, let's look at this well-intentioned effort to emphasize Indigenous people's role in exploration. Uh, indigenous peoples were highly skilled at navigating and thriving in the wilderness. This again makes room for indigenous presence on the land, but it simultaneously immediately erases their ways of knowing and being on their territories. Wilderness means a place that humans neither modify nor call home. Indigenous ancestral territories were homelands for which there were many names. There was no wilderness. Or take this sentence uh, about the range of human interactions with the environment. Indigenous peoples use natural resources in unique, sophisticated ways. Again, it constrains our understanding even as it lauds Indigenous skills. Natural resources is a culturally specific market-driven term category for thinking about nature. It organizes the biome into discrete categories that make sense under capitalism. 
treating natural resources as this universal category assumes that utility always defines the relationship between humans and the environment. That, for example, a cedar tree, a resource here in British Columbia, could be either milled into lumber or carved into a canoe. In this framework, an activity like digging for cedar roots, as in this picture, is just another use of cedar. But this is a serious false equivalency. For example, my co-author, uh, the elder Elsie Paul, talks about cedar roots as living beings with whom she and other Thaaman people have a relationship of reciprocity. Roots are a being whom they honor with respect and gratitude through precise, careful practice. She talks about how weavers love their roots like a family. Cedar roots as relations then. This takes us far beyond the category of natural resources. And we miss this if we add and stir cedar roots into a pre-existing category called natural resources. So as I'm outlining, our conventional vocabulary often attributes unbounded universality to distinctly European concepts. And when we use this vocabulary, we unintentionally reproduce colonialist assumptions. Let's take another example. This man is James Douglas, the first governor, British governor of British Columbia. And the textbook noted that he had, quote, a responsibility to maintain law and order. So this sentence treats law and order again as singular, as if only the British had law. And it implies that Douglas's responsibility was legitimately bestowed. This then is a completely colonial perspective. Indigenous peoples have their own systems of law and constitutionality. And that's what's going on in this photo on the left here, an indigenous legal practice. So what Douglas brought really was British law and order. And we can make the statement more specific to clarify that the British did not have a monopoly on law and that the British make, the British sense of responsibility was self-imposed. Speaking of law, if we look for a moment at treaties, which are a feature of British law, the text also recognized indigenous interpretations of treaties, by noting that Indigenous peoples believed treaties were land sharing agreements, which is different than the British interpretation. But this language implies that Indigenous peoples believed something while Europeans knew the truth. But Europeans don't have a monopoly on the truth any more than they do on the law. And we are reminded of this by this two row wampum belt, a legally binding Haudenosaunee treaty uh, from the eastern region of North America. So all of this matters because truly understanding different ways of knowing and being requires something that I've called transformational listening. This listening for difference requires us to avoid the sort of false equivalency that I talked about with natural resources and to resist the pull of confirmation bias, our tendency to align what we hear and learn with what we think we already know. These textbook examples are cases of a much broader phenomenon. When we treat categories like natural resources or wilderness or law as unbounded and universal, we undermine the diversity and equity that we elsewhere aim for with decolonizing initiatives, be they political, educational, or cultural. Before we can seek something called reconciliation, we must admit that some things are irreconcilable. We cannot create decolonized histories by inserting indigenous or otherwise so-called marginalized characters into the boundaries of our existing colonial narratives and categories. And again, George Manuel knew this, uh, as he wrote, we cannot become member, equal members in your society. We can become a member of a new society in which everyone chooses to share, but that cannot happen until you begin to reconsider and reformulate your understanding and your view of the world as we have begun to reformulate ours. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it over to Sujata.
um, thank you, uh, Jess and Paige, uh, for um, for your introduction to the problem. It helps me to um, to to go on to my um, my the questions I want to raise. Um, Unlike um, Jess and Paige, I'm not going to locate myself um, uh, intellectually because it comes as I present um, the, the issues and debates that I think we need to uh, engage with when we do um, decolonization and curriculum development and see the relationship between the two. Um, I want to start with the discussion that that has taken place in the last two or three years within UK, USA, and particularly South Africa, uh, which initiated uh, the, the students who initiated the movement's Ro Roads Must Fall. And, and that had its implication in Oxford. It moved to other parts of the world. But these issues have been there in Europe for some time. So I would uh, like to uh, discuss this in the context of uh, Chakravarti's position of situating knowledge of Europe in terms of how that knowledge emerges and how, and the need to see it in its own regional context against its universal context and these interventions have been important for the last two decades within social sciences and it is very uh, interesting that uh, the students and teachers um, and particularly the students have started asking these questions within um, within the European universities and the North American universities and demanded that decolonization of knowledge <clears throat> and the othering of knowledge in uh, other knowledge be put back into the classrooms. These interventions have used a sudden discussion on decolonization for the creation of alternate critical knowledge that sees the global world as being interconnected and wherein colonialism and imperialism has organized systematically the processes of exploitation, discrimination and exclusion, but wherein the knowledge of these processes have been made in invisible globally. Rather, the history of Europe has been naturalized as being universal and Paige has given us um, um, examples of the, how this has been done in the case of the indigenous groups in Canada. And um, European modernity, capitalism, and the nation states were the ideal types to strive for. And these have become the, 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 the stereotypes through which subjects have been constituted and have been, uh, re have been um, engaged with. And this is the problem that social sciences have, have, have been placed uh, with. So there has been for a long time, Southern deliberations on Eurocentrism, which have constantly demanded to substitute this 19th century assumptions of binaries and linear and evolutionary knowledge that have structured social sciences. Um, Page's discussion has shown us, and that too of Jess, that these binaries are related to uh, nature versus culture, science versus faith or spirituality, and a, and a commitment to the theory of progress and therefore of evolutionism. And more particularly, these assumptions have legitimized disciplinary divisions and structured our subject knowledge and therefore our curriculum. Uh, the discussions in the South, and I think the discussions have been enormous and varied and has been there since the early 20th century. And these have not been only in India, but have been in the large part of the world. And there's a lot that has been written on it. <clears throat> 
they have debated the uneven regional circulation of knowledge across the world in which geopolitics have promoted and which uh, the diffusion of northern scholarship and academic cultures through the reproduction of not only disciplinary divisions but also through export of books and journals best practices for evaluating research projects acceptance of articles and books priority to english language publications and then it has led to the growth of brain drain and which um, the african philosopher pulin hutunji calls tourist academic circulation so it is in this context that i would like to suggest that we have two phases of debate on decolonization and alternate knowledge creation in the first phase decoloniality was equivalent to doing indigenous social sciences and here i want to say that unlike page indigenous here means different things because wherever there has been colonial set, um, uh, settled colonialism indigenous has has meant um, those groups that have been part of um, um a part of um, um uh, you know set, uh, those group who had the land and who were colonized from um by europeans and their land taken over and this is there in north america this is there in parts of latin america and central Af america and also australia and new zealand and parts of africa so indigenous here means that which is culturally indigenous to a land and it doesn't necessarily mean the group of group staying in the land so i would in the first phase decoloniality was equivalent to doing indigenous social sciences that is outside your colonial science and was promoted by national states while in the second phase they developed a critique of nationalist indigenous and i'm going to argue that chakravarti is part of this critique and has raised complex issues of the way in which Euro eurocentrism has and still continues to organize the political economy of knowledge production and reproduction through diffu diffusion and circulation of academic cultures what i'm trying to suggest here in this presentation that we are in a paradoxical situation where the, a sharp critique has developed to provide an alternative today at a time when there is a tight fit of the reproduction of ideas from the north over the south in the context of neoliberalism so this raises the question where is the spaces of autonomy for intervention today and i would go like to talk about these matters um, as as i proceed so i want to start with an understanding of what happened regarding decolonization and alternate knowledge creation in the first uh, um, um, as mentioned earlier it is associated with early nationalist anti-colonialism in India. And Professor French has already talked about Ahmedabad, the education society and its establishment in 1930s. This uh, organization is part of other organizations that were set up to do just that, to, to, um, to, uh, to set up schools, particularly, reject English language learning and substitute it with regional languages uh, to, to, with the idea that it is the mother tongue which is very important to create alternate learning. It, and not only did they establish schools to teach regional, in regional language, but um, promoted the idea that indigenous education is equivalent to promoting languages and this issue has become remained important in the whole of 20th century and early 21st century in india as suggesting that indigeneity means an acceptance of 
language learning and teaching. The second way in which indigenous was, dis, uh, was understood in India was related to an alternative content and pedagogy, again in the early 20th century, with where there were two, two ideologues who were more important than other ideologues who also thought about this. And one was Gandhi, who promoted Naitalim and basic education, learning that is related to crafts because he was against specialized education of science and technology, which demanded high investments and it alienated, according to him, individuals from the everyday life that governed India. And he would have liked to, uh, to suggest that knowledge regarding crafts and production system would be better an option to, for, rather than um, rather than uh, specialized knowledge in uh, which higher education promotes. Tagore is an option to this. He argued for a new aesthetic sensibility for becoming, hum becoming human and mapped its relationship with nature. Both ideologues saw a symbi symbiotic link between education and the creation of new nation. However, one can see what happened in the 20th century. Both these ideologies had weak reception and after independence, they became routinized. There was a third way of thinking of indigenous social sciences. And that was to explore um, Indian philosophy and culture available in Sanskrit texts translated by the Orientalists. This variant has found legitimacy today with the present rightist regime. So these are the three ways in which indigenous social sciences were, were understood. And by the 1950s, India, as part of its non-aligned strategy, starts developing networks of scholars, of bureaucrats, and of um, intellectuals who can come together to institutionalize a new policy creating indigenous social science with the following attributes. Social science concepts should be, should be understood, learned in regional languages. Secondly, local resources and regional resources should constitute what is social sciences. Thirdly, and this is quite xenophobic, research by insiders rather than outsiders, research by nationals rather than foreigners. Fourthly, and this is an overarching uh, position taken by all social sciences, and there have been um, conferences and um, texts and volumes produced by economists and political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists, which says indigenous social science is in terms of national priorities. And in turn, it aids the national state in developing its development programs and policies. And lastly, some scholars have thought that indigeneity means formulation of new theoretical and methodological paradigms in terms of local, national, philosophical, and cultural legacies. More particularly in the case of sociology, you see a development of something in this context of Hindu sociology. I'm, I'm mentioning this because um, as I go forward, you will see that one of the reasons where, why Chakravarti talks about provincializing Europe is also because he is making a critique of this nationalist indigenous perspectives. In his case, it is part of being a group, uh, being the subaltern uh, studies group, being a member of the subaltern studies group, which has criticized nationalist historiography. So let me tell you how, um, what is the curriculum that developed as a consequence of these national, how nationalist social science uh, sciences were developed in India from 1950s onwards. And I would like to mention that these um, arenas were also there in Nigeria and other parts of Southeast Asia. As I mentioned, this was part of a larger group of um, African and Asian uh, countries which had become independent who were promoting these uh, 
uh, these pro uh, these ways of thinking about curriculum. My major contention is that these national social sciences mirrored the disciplinary divides. And that these disciplinary divides, I would argue, was based on a division between nomothetic and ideographic knowledge. And which in large number of, of number of groups and people's culture, this divide doesn't exist. And this divide has come up, emerged as a consequence of Eurocentrism, and they have contributed and continue to contribute Eurocentric imperial and colonial assumptions, which created the binaries of social science. That is, social, some social sciences have been called modern, and other social sciences like anthropology has been called, which deal with primitive or preliterate groups. Almost all of these have accepted linear theories of time. And in the case of sociology, an orientalist version has become part of doing social sciences. And let me say um, what are the ways in which uh, e uh, in economics, um, as mentioned by Page, it has meant an addition rather than changing the content of what social sciences. In economics, indigenization meant adding, a de adding development concerns within economic theories of demand and supply. For example, poverty. There were, of course, innovations in methods, and we can find that in uh, the economics. Um, and um, Sukumar Chakravarti has written a, a long book on how new innovative work was done to create new statistics on poverty-based income and calorie intake or the institutions, um, the institutionalization of sample survey through the National Sample Survey Authority and, and, and bringing together an assessment of economic agriculture and industrial employment uh, to give us a social profile of the population. But again, no substantive changes regarding the discipline was made. And we continue to think of the discipline as in terms of GDP calculations and other such measures. In political science, in its first stage, indigenization may meant searching for democracy in local village institutions. You may recall Kothari's assessment of Panchayat as an indigenous democratic culture. And in sociology and anthropology, the importance of culture against materiality um, um, led, uh, uh, led or, uh, sociologists and anthropologists to accept Orientalist perceptions, which talked about uh, um, the social as being reflected in three institutions, uh, Hinduism, the caste system, extended family system. There was hardly to no discussion on modern India. This, Chakravarti's concept of provisionalizing Europe draws from the Subalzan school and is a critique of this indigenous nationalist history. And it is, it is not only about situating Europe in, in terms of Europe, but it is based on the critique of indigenous nationalist history that he questions the circulation of a universalistic idea of Europe and, and has argued as the subaltern studies group has argued that this nationalist historiography has mirrored the colonial language of power and politics, the close association of nationalism, nationalism and historiography. The subalterns have argued that this did not allow historians to explore the new language of power presented by the peasants and thereby to develop it as an alternate knowledge. So the argument here is that the indigenous nationalist social sciences extended a class, a caste and gendered interpretation of colonial power, which was in existence, rejecting other ways of investigating uh, exploited and excluded groups, which were constituting knowledge, but they, are, they were invisibilized and did not allow for a creation of new epistemic mapping. So 
what has happened is since the 70s, the entry of the subaltern groups in the university, public university, and especially students and teachers have encouraged the framing of new curriculum and has led to the growth, at least within social sciences, of feminist Dalit and tribal studies. The Indian experience, therefore, of decolonization is intimately connected to the politics of nation state and its programs to use education for extending elite rule and power. Decolonization, I would argue, is not about delinking Euro Eurocentric epistemy, but also the nationalist epistemy and the nation state's intervention to ensure that curriculum and organization of universities reflects the concerns of those who rule and represent the nation state. And um, there is therefore a necessity to understand that in countries where there has been settled, non-settled colonialism, decolonization means an organic link to nationalism and the deprivation and, and displacement and decentering of local issues and, and, it's, and various groups that inhabit the geographies that relate to the localities. The Indian example is to highlight and contrast the experiences of decolonization, which have different manifestations across the world. And that these diversities and unevenness has to be recognized because the global organization of knowledge is necessary without universalizing the same. So I end with um, two or three issues. The first is that, as I mentioned, that since the 70s, there has been um, uh, effort to restructure given the presence of the excluded in the university structure and with the teachers also being present, there has been an attempt to restructure curriculum. But it has come at a time when the university, the public university system is being restructured through the new neoliberal initiatives. It has promoted technical and professional education against social, uh, against social scientists sciences, decrease funding of human and physical resources, encourage migration of students creating brain drain, the consolidation of populist ideologies, control on academia, together with the targeting and persecution of scholars who have criticized the nation state and its contemporary ideologies. So the public university is in a crisis. The question is whether liberal art programs like that in Ahmedabad University, which is a private university, can counter this trend. And it's important to ask then, can one educational institution or university alone can do it? Would a public university still play a role? Or does it need a group of universities, either public or private, or a network of scholars within universities or outside these to do so? What role can students and individual teacher, teachers play in this? Can these initiatives transcend the uneven processes of circulation and inequalities organizing knowledge and learning? It's production, distribution, exchange and circulation and reproduction across the world and nation states, which are organized in different language communities. Can these include everyday experiences of those whose voices have not been heard? Subaltern groups. Can education create a new inclus inclusive society, which was the project, whether of Tagore or of Gandhi? Can this also affirm pluralities and diversities of knowledge? Autonomy of institutions and scholars promoting new debates and protecting democracy in academic thinking. I'm raising these problems because I see constraints today rather than opportunities. And therefore I'm so happy that Patrick has started this discussion 
because we need to confront these these questions because this is not a problem of India, Indian universities alone. I think this is a problem from what Jess has mentioned across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to our three um, distinguished speakers. Uh, thank you for providing such a wide perspective on starting from uh, Jess's um, emphasis on being reflexive and situating ourselves um, and our own privilege in this, uh, in this debate. Where are we situated when we talk about decolonization? Uh, where does our cultural and social capital come from? Um, and what, what are the kinds of structures within which we operate? Uh, but allowing within that acknowledgement for uh, space and hope for change. Um, and uh, Paige, thank you also for this, um, you know, very, very, um, you know, concrete and revealing example of how uh, even in something as in a well-intentioned great textbook, uh, you can have the operation of assumptions uh, which need to be which need to be questioned. And I think our students would have uh, really appreciated those uh, those examples uh, as well. And thank you, Sujata, for um, a, a wonderful. Uh, intellectual history of the debate on decolonization in India and uh, uh, other colonial locations in the last century or so. I think it's a very important point uh, uh, you make that uh, this is not a new uh, debate. It's one that has a long history. Uh, there are so many, um, there are so many strands within it. Uh, and it's absolutely crucial uh, to recognize that decolonization or the, the, the move towards decolonization uh, has within it sometimes the seeds of moving towards uh, a, a chauvinistic uh, nationalist uh, alternative. Uh, so how do we confront that? I think those, these are some of the uh, great uh, questions we're going to have in, um, in, the, uh, in the debate that follows. Um, I'd like to say to all participants that you can uh, keep putting your questions into the chat box um, and we'll collect them and I will uh, start uh, passing them on to the uh, to the speakers uh, for the next uh, maybe 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll see how it how it goes. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a question from um, Hestia, who says, "What I gather from all presenters is that we need to change the metaphorical bowl of academic knowledge." I agree. We might currently be too comfortable with the existing bowl uh, because it's really hard work to change it. I'm also wondering whose responsibility is it to change that goal? Um, and I'll just uh, add another question to it. Uh, the second question is to Professor uh, Patel. What is the way forward when decolonization of curriculum has itself been colonized by indigenous nationalist forces? Uh, so we'll start with Jess and then move to Sudha. Oh, um, thanks, Hestia, for that question. Uh, it's a nice one to think about. So, I mean, for me, if you're in the system, um, you have a responsibility to change it. Like, I, I don't think that I could live ethically in academia if I wasn't trying to change the ball, even though I certainly acknowledge that there are um, things that make it difficult to intervene in the way I would sometimes like. Now, for me personally, COVID has been, in some ways, incredibly productive for changing the ball. Because this conversation wouldn't have been possible a year ago. And the fact that COVID is finally making us uh, think about education in ways that move beyond the, the kind of monastic history of um, the Oxbridge model of, of lecturing, which really comes from people who could read the Bible explaining it to those who couldn't. It's such an anachronistic way of learning and teaching and thinking. And so at least COVID has enabled a kind of reconceptualization of higher education. And that forces us to shift the ball a little bit. Now, it's only the beginning. There's a huge amount of work to be done. There's a huge amount of work in this field that has been done um, and, and many great examples to draw from. But personally, I couldn't be in the academy if it didn't allow me to try to do this work at, at every opportunity. And I would imagine that many of the people sitting uh, or, or who are on this call today would feel similarly and have done some incredible work um, to shift that as well. Thanks. Um. Um, thank you, Jess, and I'm going to repeat some of the um, some of the um, ideas that you've already mentioned. I agree with you. Uh, a lot of sociologists have said that every pandemic opens up a new way of thinking, 
because it brings together in time and in space um, a set of issues and processes which we have not seen before. So, um, uh, and, and uh, that was true of the Spanish flu and that's been true of very many epidemics that have taken place because we can see the institutions as these are and perceive them for the politics that they present to us. And therefore, I think, um, yes, um, uh, we can make our sharp assessments, but beyond that, it also helps to construct us as actors, which is what you also mentioned, because sometimes we lose our sense of being actors. And, and that, it, it, um, through the despondencies that we are structured in, and therefore, um, using this as an opportunity, um, I feel that um, this discussion may help us to think of a possible alternative um, that one can, one can put together, um, which might confront um, nationalist perspectives of decolonization you know, and legitimacy of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jess and Sujata. Um, we have some more um, interesting questions coming in. Uh, from Divakar Singh, um, I'm summarizing the question. Uh, it says, despite our legitimate urge to deconstruct the universi universality of categories, uh, don't we need those categories to sustain our dialogue with the rest of the world? Uh, Paige, would you like to come in on this? Sure, thank you. Um, and maybe I'll just start to answer that, but with a bit of a comment that bridges backwards uh, to the previous question, because thinking about uh, responsibility or turning the kind of critique I was offering into action, um, part of what I see, and I just commented on it at the end, it's what my other work has been about. Um, part of, as I see the responsibility of scholars um, in the way that Jess is talking about, is a kind of is a different kind of listening, not necessarily a doing in the way that we've conventionally thought about things in the university. So not a discover, not a new discovery or building something, but that I think part of my implicit point is that many um, intellectuals outside the university, right? So intellectuals don't only live in the university, um, and that these other these other shaped bowls are out there and part of the way institutions have been sustained is by excluding those and having a monopoly on value or this claim to universality. So um, the work I think is sometimes a little bit different than we think of. It's a matter of listening, but listening in a new way rather than in ways that are assimilative. Um, and so whether we need universal categories, I, th I think, uh, I do think that learning to speak or listen across those uh, differences is a really challenging process. And so I think inevitably it's a little bit of a, uh, one, it's a partial process, one step forward, two steps, not quite two steps back, but two steps forward, one step back um, at a time so that we, of course, we need these bridging categories because that is actually also what sparks our interest or makes us feel motivated. So in much, I've written about this elsewhere as well, that some of, I think, the learning opportunities in my own research for myself that have been most rewarding have tended to come from places where in retrospect, I worked for a long time based on a category mistake or based on a misunderstanding. And so there's a way I think of working where we have to use the categories we have because that's all there is initially. But if we can hold them more lightly, if I can put it that way, we can be moving towards this other concept uh, of transformational listening, where we can open to thinking, oh, this, is, this category is just a placeholder to take me somewhere different. Um, yeah, that would be how I would think of it. And, uh, thank you so much, Paige. I think that's uh, so important to recognize that we have that that we have to make incremental progress. I mean, it's not uh, that we say that this is impossible and, and give up the effort uh, entirely. Um, there's a, a popular question coming from um, 
I think a, a former student of ours, Saif Siddiqui, and a colleague, Amol Agarwal, uh, who are asking uh, Sujata, um, what do you think the, um, you know, uh, uh, the prospects for in terms of the new education policy? <laughs> Uh, well, there are, um, immediately all I can say is that um, there is a language issue in the new education policy, which, um, which comes from the early 20th century discussions in India on language. Um, and it also comes, to the, uh, comes from the third aspect uh, I said was a definition of indigeneity in which a uh, certain uh, culturalist argument is made of universal, I mean, um, of one, um, one language group being universal. So it comes from that. I think I would like to use this opportunity to go back to this whole question of universalisms that was asked by uh, the earlier speaker. The question is that we have to ask that if we have diversities of language groups, of um, uh, life experiences among uh, various communities and groups, and India represents this, can we have a universal standardized way of thinking about these groups? And if, and that is where Universalisms of science meets the universalisms of political projects. The 19th century notion of universalism was really a Eurocentric notion of universalism. That is, that it was European, that the entire way of looking at the social was to do, deal with, a, with the universal of that 19th century promoted. But if we accept that there may be scientific universals which do not coincide with the political projects of nation states or of global, uh, global projects of institu global institutions, then can we have the distanglement of the two and think of science at one level and think of diversities at another level? You know, and that is what the national education policy doesn't indicate, though it has footnotes and endnotes which are talk about diversities. But in the way it implements it, you know, it doesn't have this. And I, there is much more complications here because it relates to federalism in India, it relates to um, you know, the fact that we have 22 official languages, but there are more than 100 dialects which are not officially recognized as a language community. And how do we talk about these in the context of, um, uh, of, of, of the differences that are there in the country? And therefore, I, I would like to stop here because there's too much that one can say on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Patel. I, I, I've also often wondered, you know, what, it, how do we draw, have this fine balance between, um, between the effort to, to recognize specificity, um, local contributions to knowledge, uh, contextual, uh, contextualization, and at the same time, you know, this desire to be a cosmopolitan or a world citizen. Um, are they are they mutually exclusive uh, aims, or is there a way to uh, to reconcile the two uh, in some way? Um, I think Jess, uh, there's a question that speaks to your uh, uh, to some of your remarks. Uh, this is from Asmita Gattamrazu, who says uh, it is well known that we still suffer from the after effects of colonialism in relation to young students. Do you think they internalize the racist principles brought on by colonialism, uh, and this negatively affects their learning and education? Um, and I might add, you know, what do we do about it? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Asmita. That's a, an important question. And, and yeah, and the short answer is, I don't know the, the context of India very well at all. Um, I've been a couple of times and have some, some feeling of it. But um, 
obviously in each place it's different depending on the history and and, and also i think we really need to think with a, an intersectional kind of a lens to this that it's very rarely just one thing so it might be uh ethnicity it might be race it might be um religion but questions of class are also very important in this and a lot of it comes from questions of um primary uh, primary and high school education so in which ways do people internalize a feeling <coughs> of their place uh, in the world and you know I'm, i might argue that students i've met from the iits for example have a very similar kind of confidence to students from some of the elite uh, institutions like the university of cape town which has a similar role in south africa um, and uh, potentially uh, spaces like like the kind of ivy league universities in the us so i think a lot of it does depend on uh, the individual students um, personal biographical experiences but as a whole absolutely i think there's a deep internalization of uh, systems of colonialism that are also very much linked to systems of capitalism and i think for me there's interesting questions now in this kind of uh, rise of tech and climate catastrophe but what are the new things that become marked categories and one of the things i find so interesting is how whiteness has now become a marked category and you see the violent reaction towards that marking uh, that is happening in the united states right now um, and 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 you know it's, white south africans quite often have a similar response like no 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 we can't have this against us whereas this has been the fundamental requirement of a system for everybody else for the last 500 years and so i think that is really interesting shifts happening where people who used to be privileged are no longer guaranteed that privilege and it both opens and forecloses new kinds of debates around that, that are also been kind of further contributed to um, by the, the climate collapse moment and, and big tech, which I think becomes very, very interesting to think in. Uh, and then, of course, there's the rise of China and that algorithmic control, uh, which really speaks to this kind of question of, uh, can you be an individual in the first place? Um, and what, what are the, the stakes at that, uh, of that? So yeah, super interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, we will go over by about five to ten minutes, just because the uh, discussion is so interesting and we're getting such good questions. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, we will uh, finish um, at seven forty uh, Indian time. That's our target. Uh, uh, part of a very interesting and long question from Satya Dash, um, which I'd like to relate to uh, Paige Raveman. Um, in the context of decolon decolonization in North America. He says, I mean, some people uh, seem to suggest that compared to places like um, uh, India or African country, there are, quote unquote, not many indigenous uh, people who can advocate research and be part of that process. Uh, so is there, you know, how would you respond to this kind of a perception that people have that, you know, there just aren't enough voices to be brought into, uh, into the debate? Um, so I think that that is, uh, less and less true over the last recent decade. So I'm not an Indigenous scholar, so it was important for me to emphasize that um, at the start, but there are many, uh, it, it, that, the way that claim operates now in Canada, so not, 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 I'm not implying it comes this way from the person who asked the question, but in Canada, that claim is sometimes now used as a form of gatekeeping. So they will say, well, we, would, we, we can't even possibly find an Indigenous, you know, perspective here. Um, and I think that uh, it doesn't really hold anymore. And so there are very accomplished uh, and increasingly in, um, institutionalized Indigenous Studies departments, including at my university, there is a major organization that was founded um, in, in these settler states, in the way Sujata was talking about, between New Zealand and, and United States and Canada, but now is, has a national, has an international annual meeting of many hundreds of Indigenous scholars across the humanities and social science disciplines called NASA. Um, and it, uh, it brings together these Indigenous scholars working, non-Indigenous scholars as well, um, but it's Indigenous run and headed and shaped and uh, that's been a very important part of that uh, scholarly society as it's developed over the last 10 years. So uh, I think that those voices are there um, and uh, and they're also there historically, I guess, was why I was also citing George Manuel there in my talk to also remember that 
he may not have had a university appointment in the 1970s, but that he was also doing this work that um, when people write very similar things now in cutting edge peer reviewed journals that, that he wrote in the 1970s, which um, so I think that those voices are there both in and outside the university. Thank you, Paige. Um, thank you also for emphasizing that the, the, uh, the question is not coming uh, as, uh, you know, as the opinion of the questioner, but uh, he or she is asking, how would you respond I, to the position? Yeah, so, thank yeah you. for sure. Um, so um, I have a question from uh, uh, my colleague, Sarthak Bakchi, who um, is asking about, um, you know, the limitation of research methods which the field of comparative studies brings by focusing on institutions or organizations as a unit of analysis, uh, doesn't there arise a natural barrier to engage in meaningful studies or processes in a global sense instead of being restricted to regional uh, contexts? Um, anyone who'd like to come in on this? Can I, can I yes. intervene? Yeah. The thing is 19th century social sciences talked about comparison, but it was comparison, comparing uh, com similarities, not differences. And I think um, we continue to do this work in social sciences. Um, we compare um, and 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 I'll add here that the similarities, um, uh, the comparison of similarities is um, it doesn't allow for questioning and requestioning theory because methodology is important for questioning theory. In fact, methodology without methodology theories cannot be formulated. <clears throat> um, um, if you compare differences, then all kinds of questions come up, um, which you can't do when you're comparing similarities. Secondly, research methodologies have been, con have been constituted to talk about nation states and talk about within nation states. And there has been comparison of nation states. So low LDCs on one side, developed uh, nations on one side. These are again similarities. Yeah. It's when you compare dissimilarities that uh, questions will come whether that happened there and therefore you ask the question, is our theory? The case okay. of apples and oranges or something. Yeah, yeah. And I think that has been the problem of methodological nationalism that has been part of social science uh, uh, structuring. And, um, and it, has, um, it has promoted that Eurocentric ways of thinking. I would like to suggest that globally, we need to have global social theory. And secondly, that global social theory has to be based on diverse ways to regionally and locally and nationally to understand um, uh, the geographies that construct um, social experiences. And these geographies are distinct in different, uh, in different regions because historically they've been organized differently because of the linkages of colonialism and imperialism with the colonial state. So it, it implies that without doing a global social theory, you cannot do local um, and regional studies, but it gives enormous challenges to individuals and scholars because they not only um, do work in, within nation states, but they think their, their local level information is a representative of what is the nation state. And that is a methodological problem that I think we have inherited again from Eurocentricism. So a ward or a village becomes a representation of the nation state, uh, which is not, which it is not, you know. So uh, my, my contention has always been that we have to historically see knowledge and historically do your research. <coughs> Can I come in and add, add a bit yes. to that? Yeah, please. I mean, thanks, 
super interesting. And I, I, I've been thinking a lot about the nation state and the role of the nation state through your presentation and then, and then again now. And one of the things that strikes me is that today's generation of students, many of them are digital natives, uh, meaning that they have grown up thinking with the internet. And so for many of the students we're now seeing in our classrooms, um, I'm really curious as to the extent to which the nation state is the primary reference. I think that given the kind of hardening of certain kinds of nationalistic politics that we're seeing around the world, uh, from India to South Africa to the US to wherever, uh, Brazil is a great example of that. Um, you have this kind of reality of the nation state on one level, and then you have the Twitter sphere and the kinds of spaces of Instagram and the, the multitude of influences that um, young people are kind of engaging with. And I really feel that there's something interesting emerging there where for certain people, it's much more important how many responses they get on Twitter than what's going on in local governance and certainly national governance. And I, I think that that may start shifting things in really interesting ways, maybe not in this election cycle, and I mean that in a kind of five year period for, for more or less everybody, but certainly in the next couple of decades, I think we're gonna see a huge shift in people's real commitment to the nation. And if things get violent, which they almost certainly will in some ways given climate collapse uh, and in some parts of the world, are people going to be willing to sacrifice in the way that um, uh, British colonialism demanded and required and built into the, the sort of post-industrial revolution? And I think these are really, really interesting uh, areas of contestation. And I just don't know that the digital natives are going to buy it. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. Um, I'm really uh, sorry that we can't take some really interesting questions from uh, Maya Ratnam, Tinashe Nyamunda, um, Madhumita Mazumdar um, and others. Uh, they're, they're really fascinating. So I would uh, encourage you all to please um, email them to the speakers. Um, I think there will be a great, uh, a great dialogue. Uh, and I'll hand it over now to, uh, uh, to Patrick French. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Brajit. And a, a massive thank you to everybody for joining, and in particular to uh, Jess Auerbach from South Africa, to Jata Patel in Pune, Pedro Mon in uh, British Columbia. Uh, I have to say that I, there, were, there were so many things about today's discussion that were unexpected. Um, often when people try to do global events, they're not really global. Uh, this is particularly true, I've noticed, in the UK and in the US. There might be like one or two people from elsewhere, and it's like global because there are two people participating from somewhere else. This is really a global conversation. We've got people from Namibia, we've got people from South Korea. I see somebody joining from uh, University of Guadalajara in uh, Mexico. It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, and also we've had a, a, a rather amazing audience. I think we've had about 150 people in and out during the last hour and a half. Um, uh, just a, a few quick closing comments. What, one, one is that uh, I think my, my, my sort of sense of, of, of what we were discussing has been expanded much more widely than I'd anticipated. There are huge questions that you have raised uh, today. Uh, Jesse's question, who, who are the knowledge leaders? Uh, this idea of the image of the, the bowl of rice and whether it's the right bowl and what we put in it. Um, Paige, some of the things that you said about the different ways of listening, uh, about the extraordinary influence of systems of law once they get stuck onto countries and they, the influence then continues for you know, centuries. And how do, how do you go back and look at that in a, in a fresh way? How do you move beyond the categories that are fixed? Um, and again, Sujata, the points you were making about uh, the disciplines around knowledge and the, the mirroring of those disciplines uh, these arguments which were very big around the time of independence around the mother tongue. Do you have to go back to a certain language in order to progress with a different kind of, of knowledge? Um, and then of course this whole question of the extent to which uh, a country that is post-colonial loses or doesn't lose structures of the colonial state. What happens if a government in a post-colonial state uses colonial uh, systems or, or, or things that have been set up during the colonial period in order to run things in a uh, particular way. And what we're left with really more than anything, I think, after, after this conversation, which I very much hope we will continue in some form or other, is with a really fundamental rethinking of what 
it meant to be modern uh, and what we mean now by being modern, what it meant to be universal. And of course, that's been deconstructed in all sorts of ways. But again, what do we mean to be un universal now? And then for, for all of us working in the academy, how does the, the modern university try to take on some of these really challenging category questions, um, which don't allow simply for a, a process of continuation? And other, other discussions like this online, I think we've got a couple coming up over the next few months. One on, on languages, on what are the classics. So we'll have scholars of um, Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, Latin, Greek, talking about what makes a classical language, what constitutes a classical language. Uh, we'll also be having um, an event uh, on reimagining the algorithmic society, which actually alludes to things that several of you talked about today. Uh, you know, people are linked up in new ways through technology. Um, and we'll have um, Chinmay Arun and uh, Sheila Jasnoff uh, speaking on, on that. But um, we've gone a little over time. Um, thank you all very much for joining and look forward to seeing you another time. So good night, good morning, and good afternoon from Ahmedabad University School of Arts and Sciences. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.